Hi, I'm Dr. Don Murphy, a geriatrician who has been practicing in the Denver area for the last 20 years. I work with Senior Care of Colorado IPC and work with about 70 providers who provide primary care geriatrics. Each of our providers has a unique style and approach, but they have all been trained in the basics of geriatric medicine and we pretty much evolved a general consensus on how to approach the art of geriatric medicine. So what we'd like to do today is share some of the things we've learned over the years so that you can, in your busy practices, use these to take good care of seniors and their families. Would like to first emphasize that you do not have to be board certified in geriatric medicine to be a good geriatrician. Uh, and it, it doesn't really matter what initials you have after your name, whether it's an MD, DO, PA, MP, whatever, if you really have a passion for taking care of seniors and their families, you're committed to learning the geriatric principles, you will be a good provider. Uh, secondly, we know that although a lot of what we do in geriatrics reflects what we might do in family medicine and internal medicine, there is a little bit of a more emphasis on maximizing function and quality of life in our geriatric population. We need to balance the potential risk and benefits of diagnostic tests and treatments a little more, uh, we believe, in the geriatric population. And we like to keep the seniors in their home environment as long as possible and as long as they desire. Geriatrics does tend to have more of a high-touch, low-tech feel to it. Uh, that is, we're going to be more conservative in our testing and using of medications. It also involves a very strong team approach we getting input from not only the patient, but their family members, other caregivers, staffs at various facilities, assisted living and nursing homes, very, very important. And it's also important to work as a team that we, where we teach each other uh, to appreciate the specialized needs of the senior population. It's not just a matter of the clinicians knowing this all and teaching the staffs. We need to learn from the staffs and caregivers uh, important things as well. It is a fact that older patients take more time, and we're going to have to deal with that. Patients expect it. Uh, we have to personalize our touch. That too takes time. Uh, and the critical point in all this is that we recognize the patient's unique needs and preferences and assimilate that into our plan of care. We have to recognize up front that taking care of seniors and providing good time is a huge challenge for busy practices. Some of the guidelines and principles I, I will discuss I'd like to think can be appropriate in those settings where you may only have 15 or 20 minutes and in those where you have 40 or 60 minutes or whatever. That we want to practice these things no matter what the setting, understanding that it's a lot easier to deliver when you have more time. When you know you're going to need a lot of time, let's say a hospital follow-up or a family meeting, uh, dealing with a lot of different uh, challenging issues, schedule that time if you can. It's very important that the office work together so that you can schedule that time. When that happens, it's just much easier for you as a provider to deliver good care. The family, the patients feel better because they know that we're not rushed. Uh, when you're doing that, know how to bill appropriately for the time that you're spending. I will ask you to look at other webinars that we have uh, that focus on time-based billing. We know that in a busy practice, we are going to be behind. That by the time we get to the end of the morning session or the end of the afternoon session, we are behind. And it is okay to apologize throughout that process. When you get to someone mid-afternoon and you're 35 minutes behind, please apologize to them. They will appreciate that. They know that you're doing the best they can to take care of other folks too. That's what puts you behind. It just helps to apologize so that you recognize that their time is valuable. Often we're not going to be able to cover everything that comes up either in a planned visit or those additional problems that get added on. We will not be able to and it's not fair to those patients you're serving behind later in the afternoon to just spend so much time with that patient who expects you to cover the seven or eight problems. What we have to do is schedule another appointment and we have to explain to the patient and their family that for us to do a good job of digging deeper into all of their problems and giving them that kind of professional expertise that they come to expect and that we owe them, we will have to schedule other visits. That's okay. Try not to be too busy to make the personal connection with the patient. Getting to know them as people and what their interests are, whether it's grandkids, pets, instruments, whatever it might be, is important. 
I find it's, it's important to ask how they want to be addressed. Uh, I had assumed for decades that most seniors wanted to be addressed in the formal title of Mr. and Mrs. Uh, I found out that that's not the case, that the vast majority of seniors prefer their first name or even a nickname. There are those that would like to be called Mr. and Mrs. Uh, but early on, ask them what they prefer. Uh, I don't feel that this is an uncomfortable question. They appreciate it. It helps you know how to address them moving forward. Be friendly and empathetic. Uh, when the time is right to laugh and smile with your patients, do so. When it's time to express concern, be able to do that as well. Making eye contact is important. And it's particularly important when you're very busy taking care of them on the EHR, however you're doing your documentation. It's hard to have the eye contact when you have to do all the document, documenting. I mean, this is a constant frustration for us providers, but the key thing is make some eye contact. Make sure your patients know that it's not just the documentation you're taking care of, but it's them. And it does not take a lot of eye contact but at least some so that they know that you're connected to them. And also make physical contact when appropriate. There will be visits when an exam isn't important at all from a medical point of view, but from their expectations and the art of medicine, yeah, you may have to do some work with your stethoscope, whatever, uh, so that you've done the physical contact. In addition to however you greet them with a handshake, a quick hug, or however it might be, uh, the physical contact is very important and we cannot neglect that. We want to, in all circumstances, be able to give hope here. Uh, it's particularly true for those who have chronic symptoms, multiple comorbidities that are just feeling like, oh, nothing is, is helping here. It's very important for us as the providers to know that we're always working to help relieve their symptoms, find a little bit better quality of life for them, and they need to know that we are providing that help for them. We, we have to interact with families if we're giving good geriatric care. There's no way around that. That's part of the fun of geriatric care. Patients expect it, families expect it. Frequent discussions with them. We have to listen to their concerns just as we hear the patient's concerns. Now, more often than not, those concerns and preferences between the family members and the patients uh, coincide. But there will be those cases where they do not. And our role as provider is kind of mediating as long as we know what both sides are feeling and uh, hoping for, we can do a good job of mediating that and providing good communication. We do have to be aware of the HIPAA laws and the privacy concerns. All I can say about this is that this is really a gray area. For us to give good care, we have to understand it's not black and white. We cannot approach us as if they're not the HIPAA concerns and we can just willy-nilly talk with whatever family member might want us to. On the other hand, we cannot just say, hey, and refuse to talk with family members because of these concerns. We have to use our judgment, we have to understand it's a gray area and do the best we can. I'd like to focus on what I'll call the spectrum of patient preferences and this is what I think makes geriatrics that much more fun and challenging and we deal with this in family medicine, internal medicine too, I appreciate that, but as we deal more with the geriatric population, I think we find a larger spectrum of patient preferences. Very important to understand the individual's preferences. Uh, and each person will fall somewhere along the spectrum. And I kind of illustrate it with the patient saying, over here, there will be those that say, hey, do anything possible to help get me better or help prevent things. Those over on the other end of the spectrum are going to say, do not mess with me unless absolutely necessary. Um, and whether we're talking about diagnostic tests, treatments, whatever, you can get a pretty good sense of where the individuals fall out using that spectrum. Now, the risk versus benefit discussion should be at the heart of patient family discussions at some point when we're caring for our seniors. And I would argue that we should be counseling, not just giving them a menu of options. They are looking to us as professionals to counsel them on what we think might be the best for them, knowing that their individual preferences are the key in all this. And when we're looking at counseling, uh, we have to consider several different things. One is the life expectancy of the patient. Two is the quality of life, what they perceive as quality of life. Three is function, particularly where they want to live and how they can function in that setting. And then four would be the data and medical literature that would support our recommendations. And our goal is to tie all of those things in together 
and see how that reflects with the patient's preferences to make recommendations. Now let's look specifically at our recommendation for medications. I like to divide this into two areas. One is control of symptoms and the other is reducing risk. When we're talking about controlling symptoms, it's pretty straightforward. If we know exactly what the cause is and we know what the indications are for medications, okay, we try a safe and potentially uh, effective medication, give it a try. If it doesn't help control the symptoms, we try something else. It, the same applies whether we're approaching it more empirically. That is, we might not know exactly what the underlying cause is. We have the permission from the patient to try something. We try something and see what we can do to help control the symptoms. Now take it down the road a little bit. Let's say the symptoms are controlled and the patient's been on the medication for quite some time and we're asking ourselves, gee, do we really need to continue with this medication at this point? Similarly, at that point, we ought to be able to cut that back on the dose or the medications to see if it's still needed. Now, when we go to risk reduction, it's a little different discussion. That is, we're explaining to the patients and the families that the medicines we're recommending will not necessarily make them feel better in the short run, but there is a chance that it will reduce their risk of some bad outcomes that could have symptoms associated with them in the long run. The question becomes, is it worth for them to be on this medication now? Again, I get back to that spectrum where I explain to the patients, on this side of the spectrum are those, pa are those patients who would say, hey, do everything you can, even if there's only a one in a hundred chance that this medicine would help prevent a bad outcome, and even if these medicines are fairly expensive, and even if I, that's one other medicine to the multiple ones I'm taking already. Those people are over here at this end of the spectrum. You go all the way over here, these are the patients that say, no, you know what, I don't want to take any more medications, and unless it's really going to make me feel a lot better, I really don't want to take them. And if they're being very honest with you, they would say, there's a good chance I, you might prescribe it, Dr. Murphy, but I'm not going to take it. So I kind of create this false dichotomy, if you will, showing them this spectrum and ask, okay, where do you fall on the spectrum? When patients indicate, I'm way over here, I approach that quite differently than if they say, no, I'm way over here. Or that's even different than many of the patients that say I'm somewhere in the middle. But it's good to understand where they fall on that spectrum in terms of making recommendations for those patients. I would also point out that uh, the patients do understand percentages, so that when I'm talking about risk reduction, I can talk about absolute risk reduction, or I can talk about the number needed to treat, or I can simply say, you know, there, if you take this medicine, there's a 1 in 30 chance that it will prevent the bad outcome we're looking at. Is that worth it to you? Uh, so using simple per percentages, ratios, I think is a good approach to helping the seniors understand the likelihood that these benefits, uh, the likelihood that these medicines will benefit them down the road. Also regarding medications, we, it, it's helpful to see all the medicines are on. So although it's hard to ask for a brown bag survey every visit, you don't want to do that. That's a burden on the patient. But at some point, ask them to bring in everything they're taking, or at least a, a list of that. Uh, realizing that sometimes they might not include some of the uh, over-the-counter herbal preparations or whatever else. But yeah, generally a good list will suffice if not the brown bag. You want to have a good sense of everything that they're taking. And you want to know what other providers are filling their medications, whether it's uh, perhaps another primary care provider or specialists or whoever. It's a good idea to know who else is filling their prescriptions. We do have to be sensitive to the cost of medications. We know that in dealing with many, many different problems, and whether you're talking generics or the trade names, these things add up and can be a big cost burden for our patients and their families. Have the discussion with them. Be sensitive to those situations where we're really putting a big burden on them and where we ought to be looking at alternatives that are less costly for our patients. Another key issue is addressing end-of-life issues uh, that we encourage all providers to at some point discuss with their patients and their families. Uh, obviously a very important topic for seniors and their family members, uh, and we would encourage you to check out some other uh, videos, webinars that uh, we've covered in this. For example, Mark Grimm and I uh, have provided one in detail on this topic. I'd like to spend some time talking about the MESA, PEARL, and protocols that we developed last year and explain how this process evolved. 
we took uh, 20 of our clinicians that have had an average of 20 or more years in geriatric practice and asked them to weigh in on this. Uh, these are board certified geriatricians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and we realized that all of these clinicians have unique styles and philosophies and biases, but we wanted to tap into that collective wisdom to come up with these pearls and protocols. What we did is kind of meld information from day-to-day -day experience from these providers, from clinical journals, from professional organizations, and the best we can do keeping up on the research literature. We selected those conditions and disease states that are frequently presented by the seniors, and we think that this is this involves the information that's most important for providers to be aware of. Uh, and we also wanted to get topics that we thought needed more attention than what may have uh, been given in textbooks. We realized that when clinicians are providing these kind of pearls and guidelines that they're weighing uh, their views about a number of different things that affect how we practice. So let's go through those specifically. One is how we approach diagnostic certainty. Some clinicians feel very compelled to find out the diagnosis. Others are going to be able to feel more comfortable treating empirically. That is, they don't know the diagnosis and they're going to treat anyway. Secondly, there's kind of a spectrum of how we approach medicine defensively. Um, some are going to be very conservative and want to leave no stone unturned and others are going to feel more comfortable moving forward, not worried so much about that. Third, the frequency of visits that we can provide in follow-up matters. Uh, some practices will not be able to provide those frequent follow-ups and there might be big gaps a month or whatever between patient visits. That affects how they think about things. Other practices will, will be set up to have frequent follow-ups. And then finally, uh, clinicians tend to vary in their approach to the cost of treatments, of diagnostics and treatments. Some are going to be more conscientious about that than others. So you take all those things that affect how we practice, put them in, and we encouraged our providers to go ahead, reflect their biases along those various axes, if you will, and come up with their recommendations for these. We did, as I mentioned, uh, try to exclude those things that have a lot of uh, consensus and coverage in textbooks, uh, and we wanted to hit on the most helpful highlights for those that are out in the field practicing geriatrics. The pearls are actually directed for the providers who are providing the care. Uh, the protocols, on the other hand, are uh, more specific protocols designed for office staffs who may be triaging phone calls to help the providers cover care out in the field. The whole document is available on our MESA website, so we would encourage you to uh, look at it there. On the other hand, uh, at our live workshops, we provide hard copies, and some may uh, would like to have those. But either way, we would encourage you to take a look at this. It's not a long document at all, but we think that it's uh, jam-packed with some good pearls.